Thank you very much for the uh, gracious introduction. And it's a uh, pleasure to be back here with all of you. This is such a uh, great facility. And I've had the privilege of doing research here in the past and making use of your tremendous historical resources. So it's nice to be able to talk about the fruit of, of some of my research, uh, even though this was done in, in other archives. But, but this remains an outstanding uh, institution that I'm very happy to visit to talk about my book. Uh, the Road Not Taken, which I'm very happy to report is now a uh, New York Times bestseller, and I achieved that even without being denounced by the president. So, uh, <laughs> And the subject is, uh, of course, Major General Edward Lansdale, who is certainly one of the most unusual general officers in the history of the U.S. Air Force or really any other military service. He is an officer about whom Many legends have swirled over the years. He was said to be the model for both the quiet American and the ugly American. He has been written about by just about every major author on the subject of Vietnam, sometimes in, uh, in glowing terms and other, other times in, in not so glowing terms. If you go onto the internet, you will even see a, a booming uh, conspiracy industry suggesting that Ed Lansdale was the mastermind of the Kennedy assassination. And the exhibit A for this claim uh, is this, uh, uh, is this uh, picture taken in Dallas on the day of uh, President Kennedy's assassination, which uh, purports to show Ed Lansdale from the back. Uh, and that's a fairly thin read upon which to hang a charge of murder. But believe me, I, was, uh, I had a debate on the subject last week in Austin with somebody who was convinced based on this that Ed Lansdale was indeed the mastermind of the assassination. And by the way, this was the basis of Oliver Stone's movie JFK. Uh, so it got the, the Hollywood treatment. Well, I will cite to you the words of one of uh, General Lansdale's rivals in the Pentagon in the early 60s, Brute Krulak of the Marine Corps, who said, there are few individuals in my knowledge more damned and at the same time applauded. History is going to have to portray Lansdale's real part. Well, that's where I come in. I am the voice of history in this discussion because I have been studying Ed Lansdale for the last five years, and I would just like to share a very few of my findings with you here today. So who was Ed Lansdale? Who was the real man behind the myths and the legends that have accumulated about him? Well, for starters, he was a middle-class kid, and that's Ed Lansdale right there with his family. He was born in 1908 in Detroit. He was not part of the Eastern establishment. Uh, he was certainly not uh, one of the wise men who made U.S. foreign policy in the post-war period. He did not go to an Ivy League school, was not a, a uh, veteran of Wall Street. Uh, his father was an automobile executive in the early years of the automotive industry, and so many of his employers ceased to exist while he was working for them. And so the family had an up-and-down time as uh, sometimes flush, sometimes not so flush, Lansdale spent his first years in Detroit and lived a couple of years in Bronxville outside of New York, but spent most of his childhood out in California, in L.A., and he became a quintessential Californian. He hated neckties. Uh, he hated regimentation. He hated bureaucracy, very informal, very laid back. He was kind of a proto-Silicon Valley guy decades before the formation of Silicon Valley. A couple of other points about his childhood worth bringing out very quickly one is that he was not a great student, and his life should give hope to see students everywhere. Uh, but he was a great devotee of the founding fathers, and he loved to read about uh, the founders. He loved the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and those became those ideals became his lodestars in promoting U.S. interests in Asia. The other point, very uh, worth to, worthwhile to bring out very briefly is that he grew up, Ed Lansdale did, in the 19-teens and 20s at a time of virulent prejudice uh, in the United States, and especially in California against Asian Americans. And he was never infected by that kind of sentiment. Uh, he was not prejudiced in the slightest. I've never seen any racial epithets in anything that he wrote or said. He treated everybody as, as his equals. And I think in part because he had an identity as an outsider, as a minority himself, even though he was a white middle-class American, uh, his family were Christian scientists, and so this was very much a minority religion at the time, still is, and at the time was very much looked down upon by the mainstream of, of uh, American society. And so he identified with these outsiders and always treated everybody of whatever race or ethnicity as being entirely his equals. And that, too, became part of his secret of his success in Asia because he did not condescend 
to the people that he met. Now, Ed Lansdale uh, went to UCLA, dropped out a few credits shy of graduation, and at the height of the Great Depression, the early 30s, moved to New York with hopes of becoming a New Yorker writer or cartoonist. It did not quite work out, and like a lot of creative people, he wound up in advertising. And this is Ed Lansdale with some of his colleagues at an ad agency in San Francisco in 1940. And uh, this was one of the ads that they did, and there's actually Lansdale himself in that ad. Now, so he had a flourishing advertising career going before the war. Then, of course, the day that will live in infamy, December 7th, 1941, came along and upended not only the entire country, but, of course, his own life as well. Lansdale was eager to get into the fight but he was over age and had some medical issues, so he was not immediately accepted into the Army. And instead of joining the Army, he joined the OSS, America's first civilian intelligence organization. He was not sent abroad. He did not fight behind enemy lines. He spent his war years stateside. What did he do? Well, he was interviewing travelers to get information about all these strange and wondrous places where US troops would shortly be landing, from North Africa to the exotic islands of the Pacific. And in the course of doing that, he showed himself to be a tremendous interviewer, a tremendous listener. And that, too, became part of his secret of success. It was only at the, by the fall of 1945, as millions of GIs were preparing to come home and the war was ending, that Ed Lansdale shipped abroad on his first permanent overseas assignment to the Philippines. By then, he was in the Army and uh, in Army intelligence, and before long he would transfer to the Air Force, even though he was not a pilot, he was not a navigator, he just thought that the Air Force would have more room for new thinking as a new service. And so, before long, he was in, in the Philippines, he spent time uh, exploring some of the newly liberated Japanese islands and on this leaky rice boat uh, that he's on here. He was fascinated by everything that he saw around him including this burgeoning Hook Rebellion, this communist insurgency in the Philippines. And he was very much determined to find out as much as he could. And here he is with some captured Hooks in the, in the uh, late 1940s. He was really throwing himself into Filipino society. He wanted to find out everything about uh, what people thought, uh, their music, their folklore, their food, everything that about the Philippines fascinated him. And in the, now by this time, by by the fall of uh, 1945, when he arrived in the Philippines, Ed Lansdale was already married. He married Helen, a small town girl from upstate New York in the early 1930s. They had a couple of kids. But when he arrived in the Philippines, he met this woman, uh, Pat Kelly, who was a vivacious Filipina. Her last name came from her late husband, who had died during the war, who was of Irish Filipino ancestry. And Pat was unusual for a Filipina of the mid-1940s because she was not just a single mother, but she was also a working single mother. She worked as a journalist and eventually had a long career at the U.S. Information Agency in Manila. And she was very much an independent, strong-minded woman. And uh, Ed Lansdale was initially drawn to her because she came from the same parts of Luzon province where many of the Hook leaders were from. In fact, she had gone to high school with some of them. And so he enlisted her to take him on these backcountry forays to meet with the Hooks so that he, he could discover her himself what this insurgency was all about. And in the course of these adventures, a friendship developed and before long a romance. And Pat Kelly became the great love of Ed Lansdale's life, something that has not been well understood or well known before. And that's something that I had a unique vantage point on because of this, the love letters that Ed and Pat shared with one another over the course of many years. I was lucky enough to track down Pat Kelly's uh, granddaughter who lives in... Uh, Northern Virginia, and she said to me, well, you know, I have some letters uh, that my uh, grandmother and, uh, and uh, General Lansdale shared with one another. Would you be interested in those? And I said, boy, would I? I mean, this is, like for a biographer, this is the equivalent of striking gold. This is biographical gold because it gives you this unprecedented insight into Lansdale's innermost thinking, especially when combined with another set of letters that I got my hands on uh, that he was writing to uh, his wife, Helen, his first wife, Helen, often simultaneously with the letters that he was writing to Pat Kelly, his mistress. And again, th these were letters that were turned over to me by, uh, by General Lansdale's uh, sons, his boys, of course, now in their 60s and 70s, living in uh, New York and Florida. 
Uh, and so together, these two sets of letters really provided this vantage point onto Lansdale's innermost thinking, really his soul almost, in a way that nobody else has ever had before, especially when combined with newly declassified documents. And so this gave me a vantage point onto his life that others have not had, and including onto some uncomfortable episodes of his life, like, for example, what happened in 1947, 1948, when uh, Ed Lansdale's wife, Helen, and their boys, uh, Ted and, and Pete, came out to live with him in, in Manila at the same time that, of course, he was still very much seeing Pat Kelly. And this tested the ingenuity of even this future secret agent to, uh, to juggle these two women at the same time. Uh, he actually came clean with Helen and asked for a divorce, which she did not grant at the time. It was very hard to get a contested divorce, so they stayed married. Uh, but he would spend much of the, of the next few years deployed abroad in, in Asia while she, in effect, became a, a single mother back home and did a good job of raising their kids. But, you know, the, uh, the Pat Kelly-Ed uh, Lansdale relationship is important not just for personal reasons, although it was incredibly important personally to him, but it was also very important professionally because Pat Kelly really served as his guide, not just to the back ways of the Philippines, but really his guide to Filipino culture. She really introduced him the Filipino culture in a way that few outsiders could manage. And that in turn set up his initial great success, the making of the Lansdale legend, which began in 1950 at a very dark time for this country. This was while the Korean War was, was, was going on. This was shortly after China had fallen to the communists, shortly after the Soviet Union had acquired an atomic bomb. This was while uh, the McCarthy scare was, was running rampant on the, on the domestic front. And this was uh, there were real concerns at the time that the Philippines was about to be the next country in Asia that would fall to the quote-unquote Reds. The Joint Chiefs actually drew up plans to send multiple army divisions to fight in the Philippines, but they didn't implement them because, of course, most of our troops were tied down on the Korean Peninsula. So instead of sending hundreds of thousands of army troops, the decision was made in Washington to send Ed Lansdale and a handful of covert operatives. Uh, from the OPC, the Office of Policy Coordination, which was a super secret spy agency that would shortly thereafter be merged into the CIA. And so in, uh, that, that was uh, Louis Tarouk, the, uh, the leader of the Hooks. And so uh, in shortly thereafter, in the fall of 1950, Ed Lansdale wound up in Manila. And this is Ed Lansdale in the, around the table of his uh, bungalow in Manila. This is his... Uh, his good friend uh, Robert uh, Chaplin of the uh, New Yorker, uh, his deputy, uh, Bo Bohannon, this eccentric former anthropologist, and a bunch of Filipinos with whom they were working. And this was, this picture was very much emblematic of the, uh, of the way that Lansdale operated. He disdained bureaucracy. He did not like formal meetings, agendas, uh, routine, all of that kind of stuff was anathema to him. What he liked were these informal coffee clashes where he would sit around a table and shoot the breeze with a bunch of people and basically engage in, in, in brainstorming sessions where they would come up with the ideas that would defeat the Hook Rebellion. Now, the most important thing that Ed Lansdale did, did uh, to defeat the Hooks was to befriend this man, Ramon Magsai Sai, who at the time was the newly appointed defense minister of the Philippines. He was a former guerrilla fighter against the Japanese, somebody who was known as, as, uh, as honest and brave uh, and dedicated to his country's welfare. Uh, and so Lansdale immediately saw him as a, as a valuable ally against the Hooks. But the issue for them was how are they going to go about defeating the Hooks? And in the process of doing so, Lansdale and, and Magsai Sai really pioneered what we would today call uh, population-centric counterinsurgency. They went around the countryside everywhere together. Uh, they became, in fact, as close as brothers. And essentially, uh, uh, Lansdale became a one-man brain trust for Magsai Sai and implanted uh, with him ideas such as this notion that uh, you don't want to use too much force to fight insurgents, that in fact excessive force can be counterproductive because they're going to wind up uh, killing a lot of innocent people and creating more enemies than you would eliminate. Now, this can seem like conventional wisdom by now given you know, documents like the... Uh, the 2006 Army Marine Field Manual on Counterinsurgency that, that some people in this room worked on. But believe me, in the early 1950s, this wisdom was anything but conventional. This, these ideas were really being developed at this time by Ed Lansdale in the Philippines and by 
uh, Field Marshal Templar and Malay and a few other figures in, in the contemporary world. Uh, what set Lansdale apart from some others, I think, is that he went beyond uh, the, the purely military realm. Now remember that he was an, an, a former ad man, and so he loved psychological operations, the, the military version of advertising. And remember also that he knew a lot about Filipino myths and folklore, and he knew that there were these legends about the Aswang, these, these vampires that were said to haunt the Philippine countryside, and he decided to mobilize the Aswang against the hooks. Uh, and he did this by having a Filipino army unit take a dead hook and to put a couple of puncture wounds in his neck and then spread the legend that he had been killed by one of these Aswang or vampires, mobilizing the supernatural forces against the hooks and instilling terror in, in their ranks. Now, this became a big part of the Lansdale legend. You know, people at the CIA would say, can you believe what this guy Lansdale is doing in, uh, in, uh, in the Philippines? Uh, but his... You know, the way he really defeated the hooks was not through these uh, tricks or psychological operations. It was really because he understood the primacy of politics, and he understood that the hook slogan was bullets, not ballots. And why bullets, not ballots? Because people couldn't trust the ballots, because elections were rigged in the Philippines by this corrupt, feudal, land-owning oligarchy, and that was why the hooks felt compelled to take up arms to fight for their rights. Lansdale decided to flip the equation on its head and to give the people confidence in ballots over bullets. And how did he do this? It was by mobilizing Filipino civic organizations to safeguard the voting and to prevent election fraud. But his masterpiece was the campaign that he ran in 1953 to get his friend Ramon Magsaysay elected president of the Philippines. And if any of you are interested in running a political campaign in the developing world, I would recommend to you the top secret document that Ed Lansdale wrote to his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles, explaining just how he won the 1953 election, a document only recently declassified. And it wasn't by fraud. He wasn't stealing the election. It was really politics 101, doing stuff like writing a campaign song for Mog Sai Sai, coming up with a slogan for Mog Sai Sai, which was Mog Sai Sai is my guy, and as a result of that, Mox Isai became known as the guy throughout the Philippines. It was just smart politics, but when combined with Mox Isai's existing reputation as this honest reformer, it led to a, to a landslide for Mox Isai in the 1953 Filipino presidential election. And that was truly the end of the Hook Rebellion because with Mox Isai in office, the Hooks no longer had a rationale to fight. Louis Tarouk, the, their leader, gave up. Most of their followers gave up. And this became a, one of the great unknown Cold War wins for the United States, a communist insurgency that had been defeated without committing a single American soldier to combat. It was all done behind the scenes by Ed Lansdale waging political and psychological warfare. So as you might imagine, when Lansdale returned to Washington, uh, he was a pretty popular man in some very select circles, especially with his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles, and there they are together. Lansdale even acquired a new nickname, he became known as Landslide Lansdale, or Colonel Landslide, uh, because of the success of Ramon Magsaysay. side. And so naturally, when a new crisis was developing in another corner of Southeast Asia, people thought of Lansdale. And that crisis, of course, was developing in 1954, uh, when the French were in the process of losing the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, which would cost them their empire in Indochina. This was a picture, by the way, that I took it at the uh, new museum in Dien Bien Phu, which I can recommend to anybody who happens to find their way to northern uh, Vietnam, a very, very interesting uh, experience. Uh, but, you know, the success of the, uh, of the communist Viet Minh filled Washington with terror uh, in the summer of 1954. It led to the Geneva Convention, which divided Vietnam into two. In the north, you had communist uh, North Vietnam. South Vietnam was supposed to be non-communist, but the question immediately arose, well, how do you create a viable, non-communist state where no one, none has ever existed, especially when you have such a popular communist leader like Ho Chi Minh, who has just defeated the French and, and is bent on taking over the entire country. And that's when people thought of good old Ed Lansdale. And so in the summer of 1954, Lansdale was sent to Saigon, and his marching orders from Alan Dulles were quite literally, do what you did in the Philippines. And he did. Uh, and the first thing he did, of course, was to cultivate a new protege, just as he had cultivated 
uh, Ramon Magsay Sai in the Philippines. And in Vietnam, his protege was No Din Tiem, this Catholic, Confucian, Mandarin, very bookish, shy, intellectual person who had served as a minister under the French before quitting in disgust. And he had credentials as both an anti-colonialist and an anti-communist, which led to his appointment in the summer of 1954. But very few people thought that he would last nine weeks, much less nine years. The fact that he was able to consolidate his authority owed a lot to the fact uh, of the advice that he received from Ed Lansdale. And uh, Ed Lansdale immediately set out to bond with ZM, much in the same way as he had done with Mang Sai Sai. There's Lansdale right there. There's ZM over here. This was a more of a challenging assignment for him because he and ZM did not speak the same language, literally, because although Lansdale had a real talent for winning over foreigners, he was a typical American in that he only spoke one language, which was not a huge issue in the Philippines where almost a lot of people spoke English. It was more of a challenge in Vietnam in the mid-50s when um, most people spoke either Vietnamese or French, and so Lansdale had to work through a translator. But even working through a translator, he was very effective in establishing a bond with CM. How did he do it? Very, very simple. The secret of his approach is he listened rather than lectured. Now, we Americans love to go to the developing world and tell people what to do, and that wasn't the Lansdale approach at all. What he would do is he would listen and, and strike up this friendship and, and, this, and, and use, develop these bonds of empathy with whoever he was advising, in this case, CM. Now, with ZM, it wasn't easy to listen to the guy because he was notorious for droning on hour after hour and boring the pants off of most Americans. But Lansdale was made of sterner stuff and probably had a stronger bladder because he would sit there hour after hour and listen, and then finally when ZM ran out of steam, he would say, oh, that's fascinating, Mr. Prime Minister. If I understand what you're saying, it's X, Y, and Z. And then he would rephrase what ZM had told him, putting across his own ideas as if they were ZM's, a very subtle but very effective method of operating. It works, I would recommend that, by the way. It works with spouses. It works with, <laughs> with bosses. It's especially effective with foreign heads of state. And using such methods, Lansdale won ZM's confidence, and that enabled him to carry out this very ambitious agenda he had to solidify and, and to establish the state of South Vietnam, doing things like, for example, Operation Passage to Freedom, uh, when he arranged with the U.S. Navy to move some 900,000 refugees from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, thereby greatly strengthening the state of South Vietnam. And of course, Lansdale being Lansdale, he loved the psychological warfare aspect of this. He did things like hiring a soothsayer to predict bad fortune for North Vietnam and good fortune for South Vietnam in order to encourage this migration. He also created something called Operation Brotherhood. He, in fact, pioneered civic action, a term he probably coined, bringing Filipino doctors and nurses to South Vietnam to provide free medical care in order to win over the population and to get them to support the government. Uh, this was an ostensibly independent Filipino civic organization, but of course, don't tell anybody, it was secretly funded and created by uh, the CIA in the person of Ed Lansdale. So, now, not everybody that, that Lansdale worked for in the U.S. government was supportive of his forays into nation building. And one of the great skeptics was his own boss, General Lightning Joe Collins, one of the great heroes of World War II, U.S. general who fought in both the Pacific and European theaters, who was appointed by General Eisenhower personally, former Army Chief of Staff, to become the ambassador in, uh, in Saigon. General Collins was a tremendous soldier, but he was also a very conventional soldier. And did not have much experience or patience with the complexities of counterinsurgency warfare in, in Southeast Asia. In one of the very first country team meetings, he was suggesting that he was going to cut the size of the South Vietnamese army because it was too expensive to support. Well, Lansdale suggested to him that's not a good idea because uh, all these newly liberated areas that are gonna be free to Viet Minh control, they need some representative of the South Vietnamese government to take charge there, and the only part of the South Vietnamese government that works at all is the army, so you can't cut the size of the army, and plus, there's all these sect militia forces running around, so unless you want a bunch of private armies in South Vietnam, you've got to expand the size of the army to assimilate all these sect militaries. While General Collins was not convinced, he said, no, I am here as the personal representative of the President of the United States, Mr., and you're out of order. Sit down. Now, most colonels, I think when told that by a four-star general, generally have a tendency to sit down, right, Colonel? Generally speaking, not Ed Lansdale. 
because uh, remember, he was an inveterate maverick and troublemaker. And instead of sitting down, he stood up and said, well, sir, you may be here as the personal representative of the President of the United States, but I am convinced if the people of the United States could hear what you had to say, they would disagree with you. And I'm here to speak up on behalf of the people of the United States, and on behalf of the people, we're walking out on you. And out he walked out the door. Now, don't try this at home. Uh, very few people survive this kind of behavior. The fact that Lansdale did survive uh, is a testament to the fact that he had some very high-level backing in, in Washington, higher level even than a four-star general, because he had the full support of Alan Dulles, the CIA director, and his brother, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State. And that backing proved crucial in the pivotal episode of ZM's early consolidation of power, which occurred in the spring of 1955, when ZM sent the South Vietnamese Army into the streets of Saigon to battle all these sect militaries uh, that were trying to usurp his power with French backing. It was touch and go for a while. It was a hard battle in the streets of Saigon. And General Collins was quite ready to jettison ZM and to try to pick a new leader for South Vietnam, except he was stymied by Colonel Ed Lansdale, who went over his head to Alan Dulles and got President Eisenhower to overrule his ambassador. Before long, with Lansdale's backing, ZM and the, and, and the army had won the day. The SEC militaries were, were vanquished, and so, by the way, was General Collins. He was relieved and sent home. And for a shining moment at the end of 1956, by the time that Lansdale was ready to leave South Vietnam, ZM looked very much secure in power. And here he is touring one of the villages newly pacified under Lansdale's direction. La ZM was seen as, like Mog Sai Sai, as one of the great uh, non-communist leaders in the Cold War. The South Vietnam was seen like the Philippines as a great Cold War success story. ZM got a ticker tape parade on Broadway. And uh, Lansdale uh, came home in triumph. And here he is getting a medal from Vice President Nixon while his wife Helen looks on. By, he then went to work at the, at the Pentagon and, and took over a senior position in special operations, where, among other things, he helped to give the, the Army Special Forces their counterinsurgency mission. By the early 1960s, Lansdale was pretty hot stuff. In fact, he was probably one of the least secret, secret agents in the universe. Uh, because he was actually pretty famous. He was closely associated with the major characters in The Quiet American and The Ugly American. And so by the time the Kennedy administration took power, uh, they knew just who Lansdale was. They had all sorts of nicknames for him, like the uh, T. Lawrence of Asia, or the American James Bond, or the Ugly American. And the Kennedys were quite enamored of him. This would, uh, in the end, become a problem for, for Lansdale because his reputation outgrew his ability or anybody else's ability to deliver the kind of results that were expected of him. Now, because of his reputation, the Kennedys turned to him in to deal with their number one foreign policy problem. And what was their number one foreign policy problem? Well, it was this man, Fidel Castro, uh, who had humiliated uh, not only the United States of America, but President Kennedy personally uh, because of the disaster of the Bay of Pigs, which began the Kennedy administration. The Kennedys did not forgive those kinds of slights, and so they were determined to get their revenge. They were going to get Castro no matter what. Whether they had to kill him, overthrow him, whatever, they didn't care. They were going to, they were going to make him pay. But they had lost confidence in the CIA, which had orchestrated the Bay of Pigs debacle. So instead of turning uh, to the CIA, they turned to the American James Bond. And so at the end of 1961, Lansdale was appointed operations director of Project Mongoose, the interagency effort to overthrow Fidel Castro. Now, Lansdale realized pretty early on that the only way uh, Castro was going to get overthrown in short order uh, was if the US military invaded Cuba. But the Kennedys did not want to invade Cuba. What they wanted was some kind of covert action gimmick that would allow them to overthrow Castro without risking American troops in battle. Now, in hindsight, it's pretty obvious that that gimmick did not exist. And Lansdale was, was very skeptical, skeptical of it to begin with, but he tried to give the Kennedys what they wanted. And so the result was, was stuff like this, which was a propaganda poster put out by the CIA. This is uh, Gusano Libra, a uh, free worm, because Castro called his enemies worms. And so uh, Mongoose was going to turn this against them by making free worm the mascot of the Cuban resistance. And here is free worm cutting power lines. Now, you have to admit, this is probably the cutest mascot that any insurgency has ever had. Uh, 
but it wasn't very effective. Uh, the only thing that Operation Mongoose achieved was to generate the intelligence that allowed policymakers in Washington to understand in 1962 that Nikita Khrushchev was putting nuclear missiles into Cuba. After the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, Mongoose was disbanded. And crucially for Ed Lansdale, he lost the favor of the Kennedys because he was no longer their golden boy, their miracle worker. He was no longer the guy who could snap his fingers and make governments rise and fall. And because he had lost the protection of the Kennedys, that left him naked before his bureaucratic enemies, of whom the most important was his own boss, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Now, McNamara and Lansdale were truly oil and water. Uh, McNamara, former uh, chief executive of the Ford Motor Company, Harvard Business School graduate, also a graduate of my alma mater, Berkeley, a, 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 a mathematical genius of sorts who believed that numbers held the key to every important uh, puzzle in the universe. Uh, and then Ed Lansdale, who was not so distinguished academically, a UCLA dropout, but who had spent a few years knocking around uh, the byways of Southeast Asia. So when uh, McNamara took over in early 1961, Lansdale tried to educate him in this war that was just beginning in Vietnam. And he had just returned from, from a trip to Vietnam and brought some captured Viet, Viet Cong weapons with him, these just a few pistols and rusty rifles, a few spears, very simple equipment that was uh, stained with mud and blood, and he dumped this on McNamara's immaculate desk at the Pentagon. And he said to him, Mr. Secretary, these are the weapons that are being used by our enemies. They're not very sophisticated, and the people who are using them, you would not even recognize them as soldiers, although they think of themselves that way. They wear black pajamas, they, they have sandals on their feet, they don't have all this fancy equipment that we've provided to our allies in the South Vietnamese Army, but they're licking the soldiers on our side because they have something that we don't. They have the power of an idea. They have the power of an idea. And we're never going to beat them unless we can offer our own side the power of an idea that is even more powerful. We're never going to bomb this revolution into oblivion. Now, in hindsight, pretty good advice. Uh, but McNamara was so invincibly armored in his ignorance and arrogance that he chose to disregard what Ed Lansdale had to tell him. He thought that Lansdale just did not understand the higher mathematics like he did and went back to trying to computerize uh, the war effort. The fact that Lansdale lost influence uh, with the Kennedy administration by 1963 would turn out to be, in, in, in hindsight, a tragedy because in 1963 it was precisely when the crisis in, in, in South Vietnam reached a new peak with the Buddhist revolt against the Yem. You had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire in the streets of Saigon, and this led the Kennedy administration to conclude that the only way to salvage the non-communist cause in South Vietnam was to back a military coup against ZM. Now, Lansdale tried to warn against this. He said, you know, I know ZM, he's imperfect, but we can work with him. He's the least bad option that we have. And I also know the military leaders, all the generals who want to succeed him, and I know that they're going to be more corrupt, less effective, less legitimate than ZM, so please don't do this. Please do not overthrow ZM. But by this point, the Kennedy administration was not listening uh, to uh, at Lansdale, and so in early uh, November of 1963, the military coup went ahead, and within 24 hours, Yem and his brother, no didn't know, knew were, had been killed. The consequences were every bit as calamitous as Ed Lansdale had predicted. Uh, the Viet Cong stepped up their infiltration of South Vietnam. The South Vietnamese government all but fell apart. You had military coup following military coup. South Vietnam was paralyzed such that by 1965, Lyndon Johnson decided he had no choice but to commit American combat troops to save the state of South Vietnam. And that was the last thing that Ed Lansdale ever wanted to see. He never thought that American troops should take the lead in defending South Vietnam. He wanted to help South Vietnam, but he thought that we needed to do it as advisors and as friends and supporters, but not do the fighting ourselves. Again, his advice was tragically disregarded. In 1965, Lansdale went back to Vietnam, uh, there he is arriving at the airport to try to salvage a situation that he already understood was spinning out of control, working as a civilian official at the U.S. Embassy for Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. This did not work out so well because, of course, uh, Lodge was another one of the best and brightest who, in his previous stint in Vietnam, had overseen the coup that had killed ZM, Lansdale's friend and, and, and protege. Now, in the past, Lansdale had been able to override 
local ambassadors that he was at odds with. But that was much harder to do in, in, by the mid-60s because he did not have a patron like Alan Dulles. His most important supporter within the Johnson administration was Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who was well-intentioned but also almost powerless to affect President Johnson's Vietnam decision-making. Lansdale also tried to cultivate a local protege, in this case, uh, Win Cao Ki, this very flashy Air Force Vice Marshal, uh, who became Prime Minister and later Vice President, but he lost out on a power struggle to other generals, and in particular, Win Van Tu, who eventually emerged as a strongman of the military junta. And so, by the mid-60s, Lansdale lacked both a powerful patron in Washington, as well as an effective protege on the ground, and he essentially became a bystander as the, as the war went along, it's, it's very conventional course. General Westmoreland thought that he could bomb the Viet Cong into oblivion. He thought he could kill them faster than they could be replaced. Uh, Lansdale tried to tell him this was not going to work out, uh, but he was not listened to. Finally, the fact that Lansdale uh, had some insights uh, started to dawn on a few people after the Tet Offensive broke out almost exactly uh, 50 years ago today. Lansdale very quick not only was one of the few warning about an offensive coming, but also very quickly perceived it was not the big military victory that General Westmoreland claimed it was. In fact, it was a crippling psychological blow which destroyed American public support for the war effort. Finally, Lansdale went home for the last time from Vietnam in the summer of 1968, a few months after the Tet Offensive, feeling very much uh, dejected, defeated, and demoralized. He felt he was a beaten man, and he felt the war was being lost in spite of pronouncements of the contrary from Washington. And of course, he was not terribly surprised when a few years later, in 1975, North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam and swiftly conquered it by then just the empty husk of a state. Now, the interesting question that I ask in the book is, was there a road not taken? What would have happened if Ed Lansdale's advice had actually been taken to concentrate on politics and governance in building up South Vietnam rather than trying to win the war through American firepower. Of course, impossible to say what would have happened, and it's quite possible we would have lost under any circumstances because North Vietnam is going to be a formidable adversary no matter what, with more will to win than the United States had. Uh, but of one thing I am pretty sure, and that's if Lansdale's advice had been followed, we would not have lost 58,000 Americans in Vietnam. We would not have had millions of Vietnamese killed because he never wanted to see half a million American troops fighting there in the first place. To the end of his days, he would bitterly regret that he had not been listened to. And it was, from a professional standpoint, his, his life did not have a happy ending watching the, the outflow of, of boat people in, in the late 1970s, many of them his friends. Now, there was a, a, a happier ending to his personal life uh, because after his first wife died, Pat Kelly, who had still never remarried and had by now retired from the US Embassy in Manila, moved to the United States. And on July 4th of 1973, Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly got married. And they, this is them in the, in the kitchen of their home in Northern Virginia. They lived happily ever after together until 1987 when Ed Lansdale himself died of natural causes. And after having studied Lansdale's life for the last five years, I, I can say that it was a moving experience for me to visit his grave at Arlington National Cemetery. I feel like in many ways I know more about Ed Lansdale these days than I know about my own father, which may say something about my relationship with my father, but also says something about uh, my, my study of, of Ed Lansdale. And trying to write up his story, it went off in directions I did not anticipate. I knew it would be a military history. I didn't anticipate quite the extent to which it would be an adventure story, a spy story, and most surprising of all, a romance. You know, I'm just a knuckle-dragging military historian, so I never expected to be writing what I came to regard as this very moving romance uh, between Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly. Now, the final point I want to make is that the Ed Lansdale story has some relevance for today for the kind of missions that the US military is doing today because, of course, we are engaged in another great counterinsurgency today, not against communist insurgents as in Lansdale's day, but this time against Islamist insurgents. And how are we going to win the war on terror? Well, I would submit we're probably not going to win it with American combat troops. We're not going to send hundreds of thousands of troops to occupy the greater Middle East. Been there, done that, tried it, didn't like it, not going to do it anytime soon. So if we're not going to win the war on terror with American combat troops, how are we going to win it? I would argue with American advisors by sending small advisory teams to the frontline states in the war on terror to try to buttress their military 
and political capabilities so that they can battle our mutual enemies. And if you think about advisors, you have to think about Ed Lansdale because he was one of the most storied and successful advisors of the 20th century, right up there with T. Lawrence. Uh, he offers all sorts of lessons, some positive, some negative. It's not all, it's not all positive. Uh, he was not proud of the fact that he did not have language ability. He would have been happy if he would learned to speak Vietnamese or at least French. He also was, was self-defeating in many ways because while he had great uh, uh, talent for winning over foreign leaders, his blind spot was he wasn't very good at winning over his own leaders. And ultimately, he could not make them listen uh, to his insights. But he was also somebody who was truly uh, mobilized empathy as a tool of national policy. He's, he was somebody who used emotional intelligence the way others use bombs and missiles to achieve American objectives. And I think there are lessons here that are worth pondering as we think about how we move forward uh, in the war on terror. And with that, let me, let me stop talking at you and, and, and open it up to a more free willing and wide ranging conversation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have plenty of time for questions and answers. So uh, myself or my colleague Lindsay over there will come around with, uh, with the microphones. Again, please raise your hand. We'll come to you with the microphone uh, and then speak into the microphone. So we'll start right here in the middle. Did Lansdale have a, a positive working relationship with MacArthur? Uh, Lansdale had very little relationship with MacArthur. It was actually, although uh, in a funny way, MacArthur uh, kind of got him his start uh, because what happened was Lansdale, as I mentioned, went out to the Philippines in 19, fall of 1945 as an Army intelligence officer. Uh, and then a couple years later, while MacArthur was ensconced in his office at the Daiichi Insurance Building in, in Tokyo, he, of course, had the newspapers from Manila airlifted to him in Tokyo every single day because he loved the Philippines. He thought of himself as practically a Filipino. And he was very disturbed when he read in these newspapers that Americans were getting a, a, a bad reputation in the Philippines, that all these GIs were causing problems. There were instances with drunkenness and fights and name calling and all this other kind of stuff, which was causing the American reputation uh, to sink uh, in the Philippines. And so MacArthur decided to straighten things out. He very quickly ascertained that the public affairs officer at the US Army Command in Manila was not doing a good job. And so he sent out his chief of staff to Manila to find another PAO who would do a better job. And, and the chief of staff asked around in, in Manila, and you know, who's got a good relationship with the Filipinos? And very quickly, everybody told him it's this guy, Major Lansdale. He really knows uh, all these Filipinos. He gets along with them great. And so lo and behold, by order of uh, General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur, uh, Lansdale gets appointed the PAO of the Philippine Command, even though it was not a job he ever wanted or sought. Uh, but uh, it was a job that he was given, and he became in that uh, in that job a very prominent personage in 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 the Philippines, and especially in Manila. It gave him a very high profile, su such that by the time he finally left uh, the Philippines on his first tour in 1948, uh, he may well have been the second most famous American in, in the Philippines after MacArthur himself. Uh, so he really ingratiated himself with Filipino society with, with this uh, encouragement from MacArthur, even though he never actually met. So, uh, but MacArthur did, in, in that manner, uh, give him his start in, in the counterinsurgency business because you know whatever Lansdale's title, whether he was a uh, intelligence officer, PAO, military advisor, political advisor, he had all sorts of titles. But at the end of the day, he was basically doing the same thing, which was trying to learn about and to influence the society in which he found himself. Hi, uh, I want to thank you for coming to Carlisle to give your talk tonight. Um, in terms of the road not taken, um, you mentioned in your talk that the assassination of GM in uh, November 1963 was a really major turning point. Do you think the road not taken was, you know, keeping him in power and trying to work with him? Or do you think maybe the road not taken would have been much earlier because by November 63, things really weren't going well. GM was deeply unpopular. He probably wouldn't have been able to stay in power much longer anyway. So I'm wondering when maybe were 
this option that Lansdale would have been wanted to pursue when that option maybe was was closed for a successful outcome? Well, it's hard to say. That's a good question. It's hard to say exactly when it was closed, but I would say that things with CM started to go sideways uh, after Lansdale left at the end of 1956 because Lansdale had won CM's trust and confidence, had really saved him in the sex crisis in sex crisis as an S-E-C-T-S, -E not S-E-X crisis. Uh, in fact, one of ZM's quirks is that uh, he was probably uh, chased throughout his life. He was practically a monk. He had wanted to be a, a Catholic priest. And Lansdale encouraged him to, uh, to go see this one girl that uh, he, had, uh, he had had a, uh, uh, feelings for as, as a young man. And uh, and to you know, try to woo her again. But he, and, you know, as head of state, he could have marched into her home with with his bodyguards and done whatever he wanted. But he was so modest and so reticent that he refused to even see her because he didn't think that she would be interested in seeing him. But sorry, I got off on a, on 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 the SEX issue. Back to the SECTS issue. Um, so ZM had a lot of confidence in in Lansdale. But Lansdale also served to, to some degree as a, as a restraining force on him because ZM had authoritarian impulses. He was not a natural Democrat, Democrat like Ramon Magsaysay in the Philippines. And as long as, as Lansdale was there, he could push him, you know, try to push him in the right direction, prevent him from becoming too authoritarian. But once Lansdale left, there was nobody who replaced him as an American in a position of trust and, and authority with ZM because nobody in Washington thought it was very important. Uh, the CIA certainly did not send anybody out to, to take this Lansdale job. Uh, as soon as he left, the CIA station in Saigon kind of went back to their comfort zone, uh, which was hiring uh, ZM's, uh, one of his uh, maids, to steal his, his trash basket and to take the contents of the CIA station so they could read his trash. Uh, and Lansdale never bothered with that stuff because he, his view was like, why, why do I have to engage in this espionage? I'm friends with CM. I'll just go talk to him, and he'll tell me what he's thinking. I don't have to read his garbage. But this was very much the mindset of the CIA post Lansdale, and the State Department didn't step in, the military didn't step in. But the person who stepped in was No Din Nu, his brother, who was a very uh, creepy, authoritarian, conspiratorial figure, who was kind of a Southeast Asian would-be Mussolini, and he pushed ZM in a very authoritarian direction, uh, which it, in the short term was successful because they actually managed to crush most of the communist network in South Vietnam. But Lansdale warned that this was going to backfire because by locking up all these innocent people, uh, ZM was going to drive them into the arms of the communists and was going to spark a, an even bigger insurgency, which is exactly what happened. But by this point, uh, you know, Lansdale was in Washington thousands of miles away, and he couldn't get back to Saigon because all of his bureaucratic enemies like Robert McNamara and Dean Rusk and others blocked him from doing that. And so he could not uh, exercise his influence in a constructive fashion. Nobody else could either. And so ZM marched further along the authoritarian direction, which eventually caused this crisis in 1963. I mean, a lot of people at the time thought that even at that late point, that if Lansdale had been intervened, if he had been sent to Saigon, he might have been able to defuse the crisis to move No Din Nu out of, out of uh, South Vietnam and to assume his position of trust with, with ZM again. And, in hindsight, Walt Rostow, who was Johnson's national security advisor, said that this was the last chance to save the situation was to send Ed Lansdale in 63. But of course, he wasn't sent. And, if, and you know, the question arises that, that you rightly raise in your question, uh, you know, would ZM have been viable anyway? And it's certainly easy to say, as many people do, well, you know, he was facing an uprising. Uh, you know, people were losing confidence in him in 1963. So wouldn't the situation have been just as bad uh, if he had stuck around, well, perhaps so. But I mean, it's interesting that, you know, people uh, have a very disparaging view of, of ZM, uh, including, for example, if you watch the Ken Burns documentary series, which has kind of the conventional view of ZM, very, very negative about how he lost popular support. But at the same time, in the next breath, if you read the conventional histories, they also say that as soon as ZM was overthrown, the situation became much worse. So if ZM was so bad, how come when he was overthrown, the situation got worse and not better? And I would suggest that uh, for all his faults, he was a stabilizing influence. And one of the worst consequences of overthrowing him beyond the impact on the situation in South Vietnam was 
the situation with the United States because as the Pentagon Papers pointed out, by overthrowing ZM, we took ownership of the war effort. We really Americanized the war. It was no longer a South Vietnamese problem, it was now an American problem, and that's what led directly to the commitment of half a million American troops. A nice talk, but uh, do you have any insight on the role that Madame Yu may have played in any of this, and did she have a role? Well, Madame Nu certainly had a role. She was, you know, essentially uh, a, a negative influence along with her husband, No Din Nu, pushing uh, ZM in this, in this conspiratorial and confrontational uh, direction. And, you know, when the, uh, when the Buddhist monks started setting themselves on fire in 1963, and initially ZM wanted to strike a deal with the Buddhists, uh, but uh, Madame Nu really, you know, so to speak, through uh, uh, through uh, oil on the, on the flame uh, by talking about how these, uh, these Buddhists were barbecuing themselves. Uh, it did not help the situation, but that was the kind of vantage point that, that the uh, that ZM's brother, uh, brother and his, and his uh, sister-in-law brought to the situation. They were a very negative influence, and as I said, in the past, Lansdale had been able to counteract them to some extent, but he couldn't do it from Washington, and he couldn't get out of Washington at that point. We have one right over here. Um, do you believe that there's kind of a stigma in the Middle East because of Vietnam, uh, and they're not really doing any political, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I misworded this, but like not really trying any political uh, solutions. In, in the Middle East, you said? Yeah, like uh, Vietnam, uh, they really skipped the political solution and do you think there's kind of like um, hatred or stigma towards America with the Middle East because of that? Like, do you think that could contribute towards uh, not really having a political solution in the Middle East? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the, the influence, it's hard to say what the influence of the Vietnam War is today, but I will say that I think that uh, in some ways we have still not fully uh, learned the lessons of Vietnam and other conflicts because I think even today there's a tendency, even though we say that we don't believe this, in practice, there is a tendency to think that we can kill our way out of these uh, insurgencies. And, and we certainly don't do it in the way we did in, in, in Vietnam, uh, although I have been noticing that we are using you know, some B-52s in, in Afghanistan, and you know, we dropped the, dropped the mother of all bombs last year, and there was some breastfeeding in Washington about this. Not really a sign of success if you're having to fight you know, uh, insurgents with 20,000 pound bombs. That does, that suggests you're not doing so well. Um, most of our firepower today, of course, is much more precise than it was in the days of Vietnam. We have precision guided munitions, we have drones, uh, we can kill very precisely. And I think, but we are still prone to the delusion that General Westmoreland and other figures had during Vietnam is that by eliminating insurgents, you can eliminate the insurgency. We've killed an awful lot of insurgents since 9-11 hundreds of thousands in all likelihood, and yet have we killed the Islamist insurgency? You can probably, you have more armed Islamist fighters in the world today than you actually had in 2001, and what I would suggest is that uh, we're not being any more successful in, in destroying these insurgencies by firepower today than we were in the 1960s, as long as these countries remain as, as messed up as they are politically, you know, countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Libya, long list of countries, they will continue generating new insurgents to replace the ones that we kill. Uh, and yet we are very reluctant to focus on the political side of the equation because nation building is anathema in Washington, because it's in part because it's associated with sending 150,000 troops to Iraq. But I would suggest there's a different model of nation building, which is the Ed Lansdale model, not of sending hundreds of thousands of troops, but of sending relatively small advisory teams, a model that has also worked in more recent years in places like El Salvador and Colombia, and that we've employed to some extent against uh, Islamic State uh, more recently. And so I think that should be the model that we think about, kind of lower level advisory work. But it needs, and I'm glad to see that the, that the Army and General Milley is 
recognizing the importance of the advisory mission, creating the security force assistant brigades, I think that's a, that's a positive uh, step forward, recognizing the importance of advisors who have you know, usually been the neglected stepchildren within the, within the US military. Uh, but my question is still, okay, well, we've got the military advisors, okay, we're gonna teach these armies to fire, maneuver, to shoot straight, all that good stuff. They can even call in air, air, uh, uh, aircraft and so forth. But where is the political advising gonna come from? Because ultimately that's gonna be the decisive line of operations. Can we help these local leaders to stand up effective governments that can win the support of their own people and police their own territory? And you know, certainly creating effective military forces is part of that, but the larger part of it is the political side, the stuff that Ed Lansdale focused on because he wasn't going around telling people uh, you know, how to shoot straight. He was trying to tell leaders how to create governments that will win popular support and legitimacy. And you know, when I look around the US government today, who really focuses on that political advisory mission? I don't see anybody to the extent that anybody does it. It's the State Department, but they are currently being decimated uh, by cutbacks. So uh, this is still to me a lesson that we have not fully learned or acted upon from uh, Vietnam days. Hey, sir, thanks. Brian, you just answered. I had one and a half questions because we're only allowed to ask one. You just answered one half about the political advisor teams um, because it was kind of unique, him being in the military. Um, and so, so the sort of those lines that you cross between political advisors versus military. So it's going to follow up on that. But uh, who is the voice then right now that you see from your position, CFR and, and all the things you're involved in, in the national security apparatus that either is General Lansdale or, or do we need one? I think we could use some Lansdales. I mean, I think that there are some Lansdale type figures and I've met a few of them just in my travels across Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm thinking of people like Carter Malkazi and this history PhD who worked with the Marines in Afghanistan and Iraq, or uh, Sarah Chase, who was an advisor to US commanders in Afghanistan and spent years living in, in Kandahar, running a business there. There are some of these, these kind of outsider quirky type characters. Emma Skye, another one who was a political advisor in Iraq, uh, some of whom can have a big impact if they can forge an impact, uh, forge a relationship with a powerful patron, as Emma, for example, did with General Odierno in Iraq and had a real say on what was going on. Uh, but it's, it's very haphazard. It really depends on, on their ability to find somebody who will listen to them in a position of authority. And that's very hard to do because our system is not really optimized for people like that. They tend to be outliers and oddballs uh, who may know a lot about what's going on on the ground, uh, but find it very hard to communicate their insights to anybody in Washington. And our kind of our whole system you know, works against that with our nonstop rotations and also the, you know, the, the, the tendency within Washington and, and DOD in particular to focus on, you know, PowerPoint slides and easily briefable metrics. And the kind of stuff that Lansdale did does not brief well because, you know, what were his deliverables up until, for example, you know, he, uh, he got uh, Mog Sai Sai elected and helped to defeat the Hulk Rebellion. A lot of what he did up to that was cultivating a relationship with Mog Sai Sai and trying to teach him and educate him and, and work with him to reform what the Philippine army was doing. And that doesn't produce you know, body counts or territory taken, the kind of stuff that you really want to see on a, on a PowerPoint or in those days on a transparency, I guess. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a hard sell. And, but I think you know, it's important that we think about how do we mobilize an army of Ed Lansdales, who, people who are culturally sensitive, empathetic, able and willing to spend long periods of time downrange, form crucial relationships and use those relationships to, to, to influence local governments. I think that's, that's a, as I've been suggesting, I think that's a, that's a skill set that's, that's you know, occasionally develops by accident, but is not systematically uh, promoted and, uh, and, and utilized by the US government. Thank you, sir. Weren't there uh, actually multiple roads not taken? I mean, as way back as 1945, um, and up through perhaps even some may have argued through uh, 1970 uh, when uh, Abrams was the uh, MACV commander. Um, and ultimately, didn't uh, South Vietnam fall to a uh, conventional offensive by North Vietnam? 
Uh, that's true. There were multiple roads not taken. I don't mean to suggest this is the only one. This happens to be the Lansdale Road not taken. I mean, you can certainly make the case that, you know, if we'd never gotten involved in Vietnam in the first place, if we'd let Ho Chi Minh uh, win the day, if we hadn't supported the French, for example, or if we had gone along with the Geneva Convention and held a reunification election in 1956, which Ho Chi Minh would certainly have won, uh, in part because he was popular, in part because he also had police state control of North Vietnam, that could have provided an excuse for us to scuttle out of, out of Vietnam. And in hindsight, that seems like a pretty attractive option because you're basically offering victory without any dead Americans, or you're basically offering defeat without any dead Americans versus defeat with 58,000 dead Americans. So obviously the, the former is, is preferable to the latter, but you know, this is, it's not very historical to think that way because this was not how people were thinking in the 50s and 60s. At the time, they were very much enthralled with a domino theory. Uh, which was not entirely crazy, the notion that uh, with China having fallen to the communists, North Korea having fallen, if Vietnam fell, then Thailand would be next, and Indonesia, and it would be one country after another in Asia, and they were determined to prevent that from happening. So it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been very realistic to expect you know, U.S. presidents from Truman up through Nixon to simply say that they're fine with, with handing over uh, South Vietnam to Ho Chi Minh, and in part because I think uh, while there was a little bit of a misapprehension about Ho Chi Minh because while people were right to see him as a communist, he really was a communist. I mean, he was a common turn operative schooled under Stalin in, in Moscow in the 1930s, but he was also a, a nationalist. And, uh, and I think you know, policymakers at the time greatly underestimated the nationalist divisions within communism. They expected that if a communist took over in Vietnam, he would be just a puppet of Moscow and Beijing. And that was anything but the case because we know as when the communists actually took over in, in Vietnam, they immediately wound up going to war against uh, uh, communist China. So, but people just did not understand that in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, in terms of other roads not taken, I think it's true that after Lansdale left Vietnam in, in the summer of 68, uh, that Creighton Abrams and, and Bill Colby running towards the pacification program did implement some of his ideas and there was some greater success in, in pacification. Uh, but by that point, it didn't really matter that much because the American public was hell-bent on withdrawal, and Nixon and Kissinger were hell-bent on withdrawal. They weren't going to stick around. Uh, and, you know, I think they basically sold a bill of goods uh, with the Paris Peace Accords uh, because they sold it as peace with honor, whereas in private, as we now know from the declassified White House tapes, they were telling Moscow and Beijing that all they wanted was a decent interval about 18 months before South Vietnam collapsed so they could walk away without getting stained by the defeat. And that was essentially what they got. Uh, and Lansdale actually thought, although you're right, that South Vietnam was conquered by an armored invasion in 1975. It wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't an indigenous uprising. Nevertheless, what Lansdale was saying in the early 1970s is that, was that the corruption and sectarianism uh, and unpopularity of the military junta in Saigon was undermining its combat effectiveness. It was undermining the effectiveness of the army and it was undermining the will of the people of South Vietnam to fight for the South Vietnamese state. So he did think that, that, that the ineffectiveness of the, of, the, of the two regime in the end uh, doomed it to failure. And that was why, as he said, it was basically the husk of a state by 1975 and very rapidly collapsed under the pressure of this uh, North Vietnamese invasion. Now, of course, in the longer run of history, you can say, uh, you know, does it really matter because today Vietnam is a reformist uh, kind of market Leninist country, sort of like China. But unlike China, it's actually becoming an ally of the United States because they're afraid of China. And so you, it's kind of this irony of history that they're becoming our friends again. And for those of you who visit Vietnam, you know that Americans are actually pretty popular there. They don't hold any grudges. Uh, they're actually pretty pro-American. Uh, so you can say, you know, maybe things have worked out and, and there's some truth to that. But of course, that overlooks the lost decades in between and and all the millions of boat people who fled and many of whom died, the, the, the takeover uh, by the uh, Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia, the death of something like two million people, and the killing fields, the hundreds of thousands of South Vietnamese who wound up in very brutal re-education camps. Uh, and also, I would say, you know, lost decades of opportunity for South Vietnam. I mean, it's striking to me traveling around Vietnam today that South Vietnam, to me, Saigon still seems much more economically vibrant than Hanoi, and you wonder what might have been. I mean, if South Vietnam had survived, 
might it be another South Korea or a Taiwan today, this vibrant Asian tiger, that would be a, a, a free market and, uh, and democratic powerhouse. That could well be the case. Maybe they'll make it anyway in, 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 at some point in the near future, but it's, it's still, there's still you know, a lot of suffering between then and now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have one more time for one more short question. To go back to the uh, earlier part of your fascinating presentation, you talked about how President Magsaysay had been involved in the resistance against the Japanese during World War II. And in addition to the indigenous resistance, there were also American officers involved, uh, led by General Volkman, his chief of staff, General Blackburn. And those officers were very much involved in our counterinsurgency efforts in the early 1950s. Did they have any connection with Edward Lansdale's activities against the hooks in the Philippines in the early 50s, or was it purely CIA at that period? I, yeah, I don't think that those uh, wartime commanders, I don't think they were very active by the early 1950s. I mean, this was a very brutal war, and I don't think that they were necessarily in great physical shape. I'm not sure they were still on active duty, so they were not, they didn't really enter my narrative in a major way. Uh, but it is interesting that, as you point out, that uh, uh, Mag Sai Sai was actually a guerrilla before becoming a guerrilla fighter. And that actually taught him some important lessons about how to fight guerrillas because he understood the importance of winning popular support. And he understood that part of the reason why there was such a large guerrilla army fighting the Japanese is that they were very brutal occupiers who very quickly squandered whatever goodwill they had uh, by claiming to fight on behalf of Asians. Their actual attitude towards Filipinos uh, was very negative and abusive and condescending. Uh, and they very they, they turned much of the Filipino population against them. And, you know, amazingly enough, Filipinos were happy to fight with Americans, their former uh, colonial masters. And so that was, I think that was a very important lesson that, that Mag Sai Sai took away from his experience about how it wasn't enough simply to have more guns. You actually had to have the support of the people. Otherwise, you were not going to defeat guerrillas of the kind he had been and the kind that, that he was now fighting.